and done in the same direction, one way. Same thing for trips down the mountain. This way, nobody has to pass someone going in the other direction, which makes it much more likely that park visitors will be able to maintain six feet of physical distancing. You also will see signs along the way encouraging you to keep a safe distance from people who are not part of your household. Please be considerate of your other walkers and hikers. Because the Good morning. For city council meeting of June 30th, it's a special meeting today. Check, check in the mics. Sounds like a little bit of feedback, but. So we've got public comment, item one. And there's obviously been some changes to public comment. We reinstated public comment in the council chambers, but we also ex accept public comment via the phone to help our tech team manage the time lapses. We will rotate between the online and in-person speakers. Public comment will be accepted for obviously public comment and then discussion calendar and the workshop this evening. Those wishing to comment may do so once for each agenda item. Time is limited to three minutes per item. To call into a specific item via the phone, please dial 951-826-8600 when the agenda item is called to be placed in the queue. Please follow along with the meeting via EngageRiverside.com or Riverside TV cable channels to ensure you call in at the appropriate time for your item. Once we answer your call, please be sure to turn off the video or TV as there is a delay and it'll confuse you a little bit if you try to follow along with the TV as well as um, on your phone. So right now, we are item one, public comment. And we'll rotate again, like I mentioned before, from in-person public comment. Thank you all for wearing your masks. Uh, as you can see, we are um, wearing our masks and social distance up here as a council, as well as in the audience today. So thank you for, for paying attention to that. And then, so if you, anybody here for public comment? Again, anything under the jurisdiction of the city of Riverside? If, if, it's not in the, if it's not in the jurisdiction of the city of Riverside, then we'll ask you to uh, wait for your item that is specific to um, the agenda today. So we'll rotate if you want to go ahead and... So we get the microphone. You don't have to lean in. Yeah, the microphone. Up, see this microphone right here at the podium? Yeah, so you can just stand up there. Actually, I think you're supposed to stand behind the... There you go. All right. We'll figure this out. We're These are prescription. I can't be, I don't want to be rude and not, you know, wear sunglasses. Please, go ahead. Good morning. How are you guys doing? All right. <laughs> My name is Monique Hernandez, and I'm a nurse down the street at beautiful old Riverside Community Hospital. We're here to serve the community. That's our job. That's what we do. We're nurses. This is our calling. But unfortunately, the way the new CEO is running that building, it's handcuffed us for the last year. This protest today, I want to make it clear to all of you guys, is not, and I'll repeat, is not about contract negotiations. We are not in contract negotiations, so let the record show. This is for one thing and one thing only, and that's safe staffing. That's safe patient care. She's cut our registry staff at the beginning of this pandemic. She cut our per diems, took them off our rosters. She cut our travelers. We were running at 50% census, and we still weren't staffed half the time. This is about one thing and one thing only. We're here to safely provide care for your community. That's what we do. That's why we took oaths as nurses. But when we go into work and we attempt to work 12 hours, I see you guys all wearing a mask, and I know you guys have all struggled to talk and breathe and work, but you guys are all sitting now. Let's go and try and run a code. Or let's, oh, let's go and try to get medications to a patient in time. 
and you're in full PPE, you're in a mask, you're in a face shield, when you don't have adequate staff to give you a break, to be able to take off that mask, to be able to put, take a break, to take a breathing break, how can you give safe and effective care? It's a multi-billion dollar facility, right? It's a multi-billion dollar company, HCA. We're just here trying our best to give the best care that we possibly can. And it's impossible when our hands are tied behind our backs. You can't do it. You guys want to say this is the year of the nurse. 2020 has been the year of the nurse. Everyone came out for us the last couple months. Call us heroes. She's literally treating us like zeros. So once again, and appreciate, I love nurses. I love the nurses. My my family born at community hospital, et cetera, and so nothing but, but love for y'all, but just a reminder that this is city council meeting, we don't have any decision-making authority over the hospitals. And so as it, sits, as it states on, on public comment, um, you're invited to participate in person or comment on any matters within the jurisdiction of the city council. So I just wanna remind you that hospitals are not under the jurisdiction of the city council, they might be in the jurisdiction of the city. Obviously, you're inside the city, you serve the city, you serve our residents. But this is, again, the city council meeting, and, and we've got a long, a long day ahead of us in terms of our agenda, and that, that all pertains to the jurisdiction of the city. So we, we've heard you, we've heard you, we see you, we understand the issue. But again, we don't have any decision-making authority over that. So if you would keep your comments specific to the what we can do as a decision-making body on the city council here. Is there a caller? We'll go back and forth between calls and in person. Anybody on the line for public comment? Wait, hold, yeah, hold on. We're listed. We got we got phone calls too. So you can come up. You can come up and stand there. But just realize we're going to go back and forth between phone calls and in person public comment. Okay. Yes, this is Teresa Newham. Um, I know I was a community advocate, and a lot of you know who I am. And I had to move to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because my husband and I were having health issues. But I'm calling to get, let you know our youngest daughter, Stacy, that's Anastasia, passed away on May 28th in her new home in Calamo Mesa, the second day she moved there. We bought her a mobile home so she would feel safe. Most of you know she was born in Riverside. She loved Riverside. She refused to move to Tulsa when Bob and I decided for health reasons to come here and for a course. She, in 2015, she graduated the mission in dosage program and she was an excellent dosage, but she took a break. She was planning on going back, then COVID hit. Bob and I are asking that you go on YouTube and type in for, F-O-R, Stacy, S-T-A-C-I-E, and watch the beautiful memorial that was put together for her by famed blues guitarist Chris Kidd Anderson, a dear friend of our family, and I'll Be Seeing You was sung by his wife, Lisa. The beautiful painting done of Stacy was done by her childhood friend, Jamie Childers of Jackson, Florida. If you want to send us anything, please go to Bob's Facebook, Bob Newham, if you want to call, ask Al Zelenka for our number. I hope I can come and visit you soon. Let's pray for a good vaccine. My dear friends, Chuck Condor and Rusty Bailey, I talk to Stacy every day, 
and I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that's what I have to say. I miss you all dearly, and um, I can't get involved with my community here, even though I was on the task force that was put together by Senator Horner for Greenwood, um, and um, I'm going to go as soon as it's safe for me to go over to the museum and begin working on music there because Stacy wouldn't want me to not continue doing what I do. I love you all, and I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Thanks, Teresa. God bless. Uh, next in person. Yeah, my issues with the homeless problem I'm having behind my home. I've called Gabby multiple times. Uh, it's an ongoing issue. I've called the police multiple times. They respond right away. Great props to the police. Uh, but the issue I'm having is that on Tyler in Indiana, they're constantly cutting the fence on the railroad side. And you get into limit between county property, riverside, I mean, railroad property. It makes more sense just for the county of Riverside just to run 10 more feet of fencing along the flood canal. That way, when they cut into the fence, it's just one entity you have to deal with instead of having to deal with Gabby, who never returned phone calls or emails, which is disgusting. So I am beyond frustrated because they set up an encampment behind my home. My kids can hear their voices through the windows at night, so she refused to sleep in her room. She sleeps in our room at night. You call the police, they respond. Only, they can only respond if there's someone inside of the tent. If there's no one there, so the homeless people have become, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say homeless. The new term for it now is uh, unsheltered, some nonsense. But the amount of money that you spend in taxes, the amount of bills you pass to fund homeless programs, you should not have to live like this. So they, they're pooping inside the flood channel. They're pooping behind the home, which create rodents, which I have to pay, have an exterminator come up and set up traps. The water sits stagnant inside the flood channel, so I have to have come up, people come out and set up mosquito traps. All this I shouldn't have to endure. And then I have to have voices at night, arguing two, three in the morning, coming through your window. You shouldn't have to endure this. You guys are elected officials. Do your jobs, man. I mean, you guys are making it so easy for these people just to set up encampments and just find loopholes in the system and exploit them. And Russ, I've actually heard you on a radio station. Um, I think it was 640 you called in one day. And it kind of irritated me, your stance on homeless. And I see why you're leaving going to the private sector because there's no winning this. There's no, v there's no winning this the way we set up this system. So I just want to know what's going on with Tyler in Indiana. I want to know what's going on with the off-ramp on Tyler. I want to know what's going on with the encampment in the shopping center, the encampment in the flood channel. All that feces is rolling. You're talking about straws and plastic, and you got these guys pooping inside the water canal. What is stuff ends up at? So I just want to know what, what the hell are we doing? What, what are we doing? We just let them have free reign. You call the police, see the frustration in their face. They know there ain't nothing they can do. So what can we do? What is it for us to do, just to sit and let it just keep happening? Let our kids be afraid to sleep in their room at night because they hear voices coming through the wall with people. What, what, what can we do? Thank you, City Manager. Do you have anybody that... City Manager will... will yeah, I'll, connect I'll get your, your name and number, and we're going we're gonna to follow up with you. All right. Okay. Next phone caller. All right, next in person. Yeah, hi, my name is Frank Lewis. I'm the political legislative director for these awesome nurses behind you. They actually, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I know what you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I know what you said, but in reality is they do service their constituency. They are, they are taking care of your patients, so that's why they are here, and they are going to say a few words of exactly what is going on in their hospital and how that is affecting your constituency. And I know, I know Councilmember Condo, you were one of their patients a few days ago, and they took care of you, so that's why they are here, and they are going to say a few words. And lastly, I want to say 
Can't thank you, Councilmember Placencia. You're amazing. You've always been there for us. So thank you. Thank you for being direct. <laughs> Anybody on the phone? All right, go ahead. Yeah, next person. Hello, my name is Renee. I'm an RN at Riverside Community Hospital. I work in the peri-op department, which is the OR, the recovery room, PACU, and the pre-op area. And as you know, I know you said that you're not in charge of the hospitals, but you do need to know what is going on in your community. COVID is real. And when elective cases got mandated to start up again, we were told by our administration that Riverside partnered up with a lab that can turn around COVID testing in 24 hours. So they told us that all our patients that are having elective surgeries were gonna get COVID tested preoperatively so that when they came in through our doors, we would know if that patient was COVID positive or negative. But this past week, past two weeks, that has not been happening. Pa patients are coming through our doors that their test results are still COVID pending, yet the hospital is still continuing to do elective surgeries on this patients, therefore endangering the patients, the communities, and all the staff that's taking care of these patients. You need to know this because COVID is real and something needs to be done. They do not have a clear policy in the hospital. They're allowing the surgeons to choose whether they want to do surgery or not. Some of them have elected to continue to do surgery even though the test is COVID pending. But some of the surgeons, and I give those surgeons high marks for saying, no, I will not do surgery on this patient that we do not know their test result. So these are the things that you need to know. You are community leaders. COVID is a community problem. And our hospitals, where patients are supposed to be safe, need to be safe. And the hospital needs to be accountable for this. So that is what I'm just telling you that is going on in our hospital. That is why we are all here today to fight for patient safety and staffing because we are the people that are taking care of your community. Thank you. Respect to all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Any callers? Any phone callers in the queue? Good afternoon. Oh, hold on. Hey, hold on. There's a phone caller. Hi. Uh, my go. name is uh, Keith Nelson, a, a local resident. And today I just wanted to call the city council and the mayor and just plant a seed uh, for an event we're planning. Uh, my son, Ryan, who's on the Commission on Disabilities, and I have been on the Disability Sports Festival um, forming committee for many years. Last year, we renamed it the Ability Sports Festival, and it was hand uh, hosted in San Bernardino. We now want to move it to the city of inclusion, Riverside, and I just want to guys make you aware of that I'll be uh, working with the Commission on Disabilities and hopefully local schools and parks to bring the largest disability sports festival to the city of Riverside in the upcoming year. Um, this is paramount, especially for our special needs and disability, uh, disabled community, because most of our programs have been canceled due to the COVID crisis. So as soon as that um, health directive is, is um, lifted, we want to open the community back up and, so, and support that community. And I just want the city council and mayor to know that um, we're going to be approaching them over the next couple of months or a year, and we want to bring this huge festival to Riverside. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Keith. Next comment in person. Yes, good afternoon, city council members. My name is Rosanna Mendez. I'm the executive director of SEIU Local 121RN, nurses and licensed professionals. And I understand, as Frank, my colleague Frank mentioned earlier, that you may not, and as you have all said, you may not have jurisdiction over Riverside Community Hospital, 
But as Frank also mentioned, one of you was a patient recently, but beyond that, all of you have at some point been patients at that hospital or have had family members or friends or other loved ones uh, been treated at that hospital. So this is a community issue. There's a public health emergency. There's so many issues that are going on in relation to the pandemic, but even before the pandemic hit, there's so many issues that are priority that these nurses deal with. We had a gentleman speak earlier about the homelessness uh, crisis as well. The nurses deal with that issue. Anything that you can point to related to health, public health, these nurses deal with on a daily basis. And they do it with, not, with insufficient staff, not just insufficient nurses because the, the hospital violates nurse to patient ratios, but insufficient support staff and insufficient resources to be able to do their job safely for, for, for their patients. This is what they care about. This is what they signed up for, to take care of patients. And again, although you may not have jurisdiction over the hospital, you absolutely can make a phone call. As concerned citizens, residents of this county, many, the majority of the folks here today are also your constituents, and they also care for your other constituents around Riverside. So it is so important that they feel not just heard, but that they feel supported by this leadership body, that you all take into account all the work that they do every single day, what they suffer through, and that they should not have to do that. They, nurses should not have to deal with that. I'm sure you all have heard this, that nurses are the number one most trusted and respected for profession for 18 years running. There's a reason for that. They put their lives on the line, especially now. It is more, more so now more than ever. And the kinds of things that are going on in the hospital are completely unacceptable. The approach that management has taken, completely unacceptable. And I will reiterate what Monique Hernandez said, one of the registered nurses who works there, that this is not and has never been about contract negotiations. This strike, 10 day strike is historic in nature because it is the first time ever that there has been a strike before contract negotiations even begin. The contract doesn't expire until September 15th. So it's more information that you may want to know or need to know, but it is so important because there is spin going out there by hospital management. And so when we're urging you to make phone calls, we wanna make sure that you have the correct information. We don't even go to the table until July to begin bargaining. So this is not about that, it is historic because it's the first time ever that nurses go on strike over staffing as the sole issue. Lack of sufficient nurses, lack of sufficient support staff, and all of the things that they deal with throughout the entire hospital are things that you absolutely have personal jurisdiction over, that you absolutely can call and urge the CEO and other hospital administrators at Riverside to stand with nurses. It is time. That other that leaders in this community, including all of you, stand Thank with you nurses. For your comments. Show of hands, who is willing to call the Riverside Community Next Hospital on behalf of nurses? Show of hands. Next Show of one. We got one. Your time is two. up. Please move on. Thank time you. is up. We got you. another caller. Good morning, Honorable Mayor. Mayor, it's your friend, Mary Jimenez Basias, and all city council, loving you guys from a distance. I just want to um, share with you a little bit, you know, I've been working at Riverside Community Hospital for quite some time, and I stand in agreement of what the nurses are going through. You know, we're going through this as a nation, but we're also going through this as a city, and what I've witnessed as the travelers have come in it is like um, things that are, should not be happening, and they are addressed in the hospital as leaving maybe dirty masks or dirty uh, scrubs in the uh, health area, like your cafeteria. So those things that are being pointed out, they're to be truthful of that. And also with the nurses, I mean, I've, I've witnessed no lunch break, 12-hour shifts. I've witnessed not even a break or running down to get food for them so they can carry on the shift as ending as a 12th hour. Um, show compassion. Rusty, I, I know you do. And I, I thank you guys all for taking the moment. And I know they're, they're kind of worked up because they're really tired. They're really tired um, working those long hours. And God bless all of you guys and take care. Thank you. Next in-person commenter. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vanessa Marietta. I've been a nurse at Riverside Community Hospital for five years. Um, I look a little young, I know. But I have started off in the CVU, and I transferred down to ER because it was always a mess. And so I went down there to get a taste of what's going on, and boy, did I. 
There's no breaks. Night shift is horrible. There's no resources for, for help. They're, they put all the work on a nurse. During the pandemic, instead of having support for us, you know what they did? They, lay, they, they took EBS workers, people who were supposed to clean the hospital, they cut all of them. There was like one person cleaning the whole hospital. So instead of preventing COVID infections in the hospital, what do they do? They, they expect the nurses to clean the patient, take care of the patient, clean the hospital, draw blood, and do everything. EKGs, everything. Um, it's just, it was an unbearable work of environment. We had to call California Department of Public Health. This hospital is in the city of Riverside. Um, we deal with homeless people every day. What that <laughs> man said, it, it, he had a lot of right to say that. I, maybe you guys need to do more mental health clinics. Maybe you guys need to do more support for um, people who need shelter, d addiction programs. I don't know what you can do, but we definitely there needs to be a conversation about it because we as nurses deal with the homeless population every day. Uh, I just wanted you guys to know that we're not getting breaks. We're not getting 15 minute breaks. I don't know how you guys like to go about your day without taking a breather and enjoying a cup of coffee and going to the bathroom. Uh, I, can, I love my job, I love helping people, but I, do, I would like to just chill for 15 minutes and know that my patients are safe and not have to put it on another nurse who has their own patient load and be like, okay, pray to God nothing happens while I'm gone. Um, I just don't think it's fair. Uh, I think that you guys should definitely make calls to the CEO um, is to show our appreciation for us because it, we're feeling very unappreciated at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Any more callers? Next caller on the line. Hi, Mayor and Council. My name is Matthew Ritzy, and I am a homeowner here in Ward 5. I live in the Riverwalk of Vista community, and I am also on the HOA board for this community and wanted to also echo the homeless issues that the other gentleman had brought up which uh, we are really close to that same area uh, Tyler in Indiana which that canal leads down to uh, on the border of our HOA property off of Vallejo in Indiana and we do have the same issues of uh, certain homeless uh, individuals crossing through our fence line it's an HOA fence line that they have done uh, significant amounts of damage over the past couple of years. And since this area is open to the public for them to cause damage, uh, this has just been a reoccurring expense for our community. And uh, one of my issues is when I call the 311 call center and uh, you know give them the information needed to do something about these encampments, uh, you know, very little information is ever shared back with me as far as what's been done. I try to get feedback after calling back in and uh, it's, it's just very little information is given to me in, in, in what can be done and what has been done. Uh, law enforcement, uh, huge supporter of law enforcement and police officers come out here and they do respond. Uh, however, these individuals just come right back and and quite honestly i know law enforcement has a lot better things to do and uh you know if we could just find a solution for this area that gets these individuals out of this canal off of this hill that's again behind my home like the other gentleman and we are constantly hearing <laughs> the screaming and uh, i mean these some of these individuals have major mental health issues so uh, our, our issues are, are, are a lot the same in this general area. So I would appreciate uh, looking into that. And I just wanted to make a final comment just about, I, and, I, and I apologize, I have not been following as closely as I should be in terms of uh, budget or, or any talks about uh, our police department. But uh, I just want to say that I'm a huge supporter of our, our police department. And I just hope and pray that if the council ever has to come down to a decision on whether to fund uh, our, our law enforcement, uh, that they would do so fully, uh, fully staffed as to what we have currently or even greater. We need them more than ever, and uh, I fully, fully appreciate what they do for our community. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Next in person. Hi, my name is John Bacher. First and foremost, I'm a nurse. I'm not 
a political advocate, activist, or anything. I'm a nurse with all these people. Do you see how many people are out there on the street trying to save lives, trying to make sure that our patients are safe? Your people. I know you said you have no jurisdiction. You don't, and we don't expect you to. But what we would like is to have each and one of you come out and support us. We'll walk the line with you. Your people, your constituents are out there honking for us every single day. People who don't belong to the nurses union are out there supporting us. Children, dogs, we have everybody out there. We don't have the support of our city council, which is sad. And I urge you all, come walk with us. We'd be happy to have you. We'll give you a t-shirt. No judgment, please come and help us. We need it. Thanks, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any more callers online? Callers on the phone? How many more callers on the phone? Thank you. Good morning slash afternoon. Uh, thank you for listening to my comments today. My name is Teddy Page. I live in Riverside. I'm a recent UCR sociology major graduate. Um, I was a, I'm also a veteran. I served in the U.S. Army for eight years, six under the title as a medic, two as uh, a different occupation. I wanted to speak on behalf of the nurses today and the, this county administration's failure to support the medical staff and its citizens. Um, most of the papers today are saying that Riverside hospitals are at 90%, 98% capacity, meaning that they're almost at 100% capacity filled. I called when we were having this discussion about wearing masks in public, whether you guys were gonna allow it or you know, uh, loosely allow it. And I said, at what point will medical professionals become exhausted, overwhelmed? And lo and behold, call me the prophetical son of whatever you wanna call it, we are here because of your failure today. It is not that difficult to mandate people to wear masks when it protects community and it protects your workers. Um, sure, there are failures on the hospital administration, but policy-wise, we were having the debate about whether, whether we should listen to health experts recommend masks or not versus the conversation of allocating resources so people could comply and keep their sanity because everyone is tired of this and that's understandable. It is very infuriating to hear you all make decisions that do not reflect the, the community of healthcare professionals who have made lifetime careers out of this on subjects that protect our community. So at what point does arrogance and self-interest become kind of a factor to think about in this situation? It's really disappointing to see that this is where we're at today when we've had time to prepare and to prevent this. Um, this admin, the Riverside County administration is starting to reflect the views of the very top, and that is not necessarily the best interest when you look at health experts such as Dr. Fauci and other, low, even local recommendations about what we need to do. This administration needs to really get their head together and make decisive decisions that protects this community. We are the leading country in COVID cases. We, have, we are the leading country in people who have not even been yet tested. We're supposed to be the example. Governor Newsom has, has done many things to set things right, but this county does not seem to support that philosophy to protect our community and our workers. Get it together. You work for us. The tax money that we pay from when we work, especially. Three minutes are up. Next in person. Hi, good morning. My name is Jess Cardenas. I'm a registered nurse at Riverside Community Hospital. I work in CVU and PCU, and I understand that the hospital may not be your jurisdiction, but what is important to know is how the nurses are being treated. When this pandemic started, our CEO locked up all the N95s, and they were the ones that chose what nurses got what protection. It shouldn't be like that. It should be the same equal protection for all nurses. They said that they were gonna get rapid testing so we know what patients have COVID and not. It lasted maybe in a week and then they started getting longer COVID testing. 
longer to, it took longer for, to get the test results. And what happened? Nurses got exposed. We have so many nurses out because of COVID. Yep. We have an EVS uh, worker that passed away. May she rest in peace. We have a lab, te lab lobotomist that lost her life also by COVID. And why? Because they were not given the equal proper protection that they deserve. We are all there to take care of our community. We all love nursing. This is our passion. And for the CEO and all the leadership to tell us that we do not deserve the same amount of protection for all of us, and we all have families, we all have loved ones. Many of us live in hotels right now. Many of us live in our RVs. We don't want to expose our families. We get Amazon shipping, Target shipping. We don't want to expose the community because that's not what it's about. And we shouldn't have to do that. We should be able to go to work, given the protection that we need, the proper staffing that we need, so we can take off our N95s through a 12 hour shift. So we can go take a break and somebody watch our patients and not think, okay, let me just take a bite because nobody's watching my patients and if something happens, it's me. That's not right. That's not right. So I'm just speaking on behalf of my coworkers. We would love for you guys to uh, strike with us to walk the line to hear that my my story is only one story of many millions of stories that we have So please if you can just give us the opportunity to share those stories with you And maybe you may not be able to make a difference inside our hospital But you can make a difference with the city and have the community hear what is really going on behind those lines behind those doors Thank you Thank you <laughs> Next caller Public comment on the phone. Thank you. Hello, Council. This is Aurora Chavez. I live in Ward 6, and you know me. Um, I just want to really uh, understand what you guys are doing. We, you put our police and fire at risk for uh, the 4th of July as to all month of June. Uh, having them like cat and mouse going around and around, they're not going to do that. They don't have time to do that. So I'm really surprised that you put our police and fire in that situation. Uh, the ones who fire, are doing the fireworks know how to get around them, and they're doing a really good job now because it's affecting all our animals. You know, my poor animal has gone berserk, and now they're, it's on medication. And so, and then now we're having the thing going on with the, the nurses. The nurses need to be in the hospitals helping people. They don't need this petty stuff. They need to get it fixed and get it uh, fixed right and get them back in the hospital helping people with their are trained to do. And heaven forbid if, if we get any worse as the coronavirus thing goes worse and they're out here doing that. No, they don't need to do that. They don't have to deal with that. And don't say it's not involving money. Come on. They have the money to take care of that. That is ridiculous. We need to put them back in the hospitals where, the, where, the, where they belong to do the service they, they are trained to do. So please don't play with, around with our emergency services. The, the nurses are emergency services. Our fire and police are emergency services. Don't play around with them. That we need them. We're the very vital for Riverside. So please do not do that. Uh, we're, and we still haven't hit Fourth of July yet. So you know we'll see what that's going to turn out like. So anyway, um, just watch, watch what council is going to do because uh, you guys are in charge of this. So do your best. Come on, guys, do your best. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Next in-person caller. Or in-person speaker. Okay. I'm Carmen. I've been working. I'm an RN. I've been working in Riverside Community Hospital uh, for 15 years. I work as a med surge nurse. And then uh, for the past two years, I've been, I become a dedicated uh, full-time lunch relief nurse for med surge and tele. And so, uh, as you can see, a lot of nurses have their placards with saying like they they need breaks they don't have breaks they they, they were not able to get their 15 you know 15 free 15 uh free 15s and uh lunch break so uh so lately uh the on may end of may the the mediation agreement expired and so one of our you know our boss our director told us in uh in in our uh, lunch relief uh, and float pool department, uh, she told us that we are not, you know, lunch relief nurses are not protected anymore, that we can be pulled out on the floor. So basically, what she's saying is we cannot, you know, they can make us 
uh, take care of patients on the floor and not give breaks to the nurses. So it's been going on like that for like during the pandemic. And then one time even one of the lunch relief nurse uh, not really refused, but he was telling the, the unit that he worked uh, to give lunch to uh, the, that he's gonna get a uh, patient gonna be pulled out on the floor and then he said actually that you know it's a violation of the, uh, the contract agreement of our CBA and then uh, and so he got reprimanded the next day uh, was even suspended for for insubordination for not taking you know the the patient because on the CBA it says they're like we lunch relief can only pulled out on the floor in cases of crisis only in cases of crisis so at that time there was no crisis and so anyway so he got suspended and my experience on the on uh, the night before our uh, strike you know start so all the lunch relief nurse, nurses was pulled out on the floor we were not giving breaks to the to the nurses so anyway they were complaining that you know they don't get their breaks they don't get their lunch but and yet we me as a full-time regular lunch relief nurse was you know pulled out to the floor and not giving breaks to the nurses so at this pandemic you know time in covid and so i think the nurses really need their breaks and you know imagine having to use n95 with the gown or the face mask for 12 hours without not you know without having breaks and so I, I personally I yeah three minutes are up thank you any more any more phone callers thank you mayor and city council Today at 11 o'clock, I went online to view the meeting. And under video, it says not available. So I'm trying to get the video, which is still not available. Uh, so I stay on the phone for close to half an hour. Finally, 30 minutes in, the video is starting progress. So basically, that's 27 minutes of public comment that was not recorded or that's not available online. It's very disappointing. Can somebody in the IT department please check into that? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any, any, other, any other public comment other than from the nurses? Is this the last one? We're going to have to cut off public comment. Okay, so we need to move on with the rest of our agenda today. So this will be the last speaker from from your group. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Liz Losova, and I'm going to spare you guys the story of the hospital since, as you guys said, it's not your jurisdiction. But I do want to remind you: you all are human, just like us. You all have family, and you all, at one point, will <clears throat> be in a hospital or have been in a hospital, and. None of you are exempt from illness. None of us on this side are you on that side. So even though you don't have jurisdiction, you all have voices that can speak up, not just for the nurses, but for your community, for the community, for the city of Riverside. So I ask you, please, to use your voices and use your power to speak up for those who can't. Thank you. Thank you. Final caller online on the, on the phones. Any more callers on the phone? My name is Ricardo Cisneros. I'm the executive secretary treasurer of the Ellen Empire Labor Council. And I'm calling in in support of our sisters and brothers from SEIU 1 to 1 RN. We need to make sure that our nurses and our, our frontline essential workers are protected. Nurses should not be asking RCH for the proper PPE needed. Nurses should not be asking RCH 
for, for the things that they need so they can take care of themselves and take care of their families. Um, as a council, I understand that it's not under your jurisdiction, but we gotta understand it is our community. And as a council, you should protect our community as a whole, including our nurses, which I urge you to, to reach out to RCH and ask them to do the right thing, the decent thing to do, and take care of our nurses, which they're our front line right now dealing with this COVID uh, pandemic. Reach out to RCH and ask them to settle their contract with SEIU 121RN and make sure that they do as what they say they are, right? They, they, they say they are the Riverside Community Hospital. Well, I say to them, act like it and do the right thing for the community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings public comment to an end. You've already been up for three minutes, ma'am. Thank you for your, your comments. Any more? That was the last phone caller. We'll take a break for five minutes. Mayor, I did have a comment. What is the 2020 census? Every 10 years, the census records everyone living in this country. It's written in the Constitution and comes in a questionnaire that counts everyone who lives at your address on April 1st. The data can be used to inform funding for services like fire stations, schools, clinics, and representation that affect your community. How will 2020 census data be used? Where there are more people, there are more needs for public services. That's why the census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. How does the 2020 census affect representation? 
There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. These get distributed to the 50 states by population, and an accurate census response helps your state get the right amount of seats. States with smaller populations get at least one, while states with larger populations might get more. How do I take the 2020 census? In March 2020, every address in the country will receive an invitation to complete a simple questionnaire. And there are three ways to respond. Number one, do it online. Number two, call by phone. Number three, send it by mail. For those who don't respond, a census taker from your community will follow up and assist you. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Good morning, Riverside. It's your mayor, Rusty Bailey. I'm here at the Glenwood Avenue entrance to Mount Rubido. That's right. Your favorite place to get your steps in is back open. I'm very glad to be delivering this message to you, and I know you're glad to hear it. The decision to reopen this very popular outdoor recreation spot was done with your safety in mind. So you will see some changes when you come out. First of all, do not try to enter at the Ninth Street entrance. That remains closed until further notice. It's under construction over there. So park your car at Ryan Bonamenio Park and walk up Glenwood Avenue to this entrance. When you get here, you'll see that trips up the mountain are all being done in the same direction, one way. Same thing for trips down the mountain. This way, nobody has to pass someone going in the other direction, which makes it much more likely that park visitors will be able to maintain six feet of physical distancing. You also will see signs along. Following public comment, any, any um, brief response to public comment? Council members, I think it was Placencia and Melendres. Um, Councilmember Melendres can go first. I think he was before me. Yeah, brief, re brief response, please. Okay, I don't know where he's at, so I'll just start. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, okay thank you. So I just wanted to quickly respond to uh, Mr. Young. Uh, he talked about some flood control um, property, which um, Araceli and I have worked closely with flood control and have been out several times. The challenges in that area is that we don't control that area. Um, so I understand his frustration, um, but that's something that we are actively have been working on for, for a few months. The other area on Indiana and Tyler, something that I've talked to our, our staff about, um, with the homeless uh, unsheltered population setting up camp there often. So I just wanted to reiterate that I do report that daily as I drive by every day. So it is a challenge that we're dealing with, especially with COVID and our staffing. So I urge our community to continue to report, but be patient as we have some limitations. Um, so thank you um, for those that called. And then the HOA, um, the other property, I have been in communication with one of your HOA members as well to address your concerns. So thank you. Councilmember Lindres. Yes, thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the nurses that came out and spoke on behalf of their patients and also their, their protections. Although, Mayor, I know we... We don't uh, have direct uh, communication and are directly involved in any kind of agreements. I think we can be an advocate for the nurses. And if, if, if they can't come to City Hall and express their concern, uh, where can they go as, our, as, as we represent the entire community? I, I, I was out last Friday and they were very concerned about the lack of protections for themselves, but also the lack of protections for uh, the patients. And I, I think it's something that we need to be aware of. I think it's something that we at least need to re uh, raise questions out uh, about and and uh, communicate uh, those concerns with the hospital. But I think as a group, we, we do have some influence over that. And I, and I think we, we need to take steps towards that. 
Thank you, and thank you to the nurses for coming out and, and sharing your concern. Thank you, Mayor. You got it. All right, that's moving on after item one public comment. I've got a quick preface for discussion calendar. This is the meaning of the masks. As you can see us wearing our masks, COVID-19 has surged in our county. And so we've got a little inspiration. Cue up the, the governor's mask video, please. There you go. Preface to the rest of the meeting today, several discussion calendar items on point with that, that message from a bipartisan collection of our previous governors. Thought that would uh, set the stage for today's meeting. And first discussion calendar item. Item two, Stephanie Holloman's gonna review order of Director of Emergency Services providing minimum staffing to slow down the spread of COVID-19 among staff. Honorable Mayor and Council, Stephanie Holloman, Human Resources Director. Can you hear me okay? Um, I will be, thank you. I will be reviewing the city's minimum staffing order, the city's return to work plan, and the status of returning essential staff to city facilities. In the Governor's Executive Order 3320, the federal government identified 16 critical infrastructure sectors who are considered vital to U.S. security, economics, public health, and safety. He ordered that Californians working in these 16 critical infrastructure sectors continue their work. Pursuant to Executive Order 3320, the city's current minimum staffing order was implemented effective March 19th. It was ratified by Council on March 31st and continued again by Council on May 26th and June 16th. Consistent with OSHA health guidelines, CDC pandemic guidance and the governor's resilience roadmap, the city has created a safe return to work framework for departments to return essential employees to the workplace. If I can please ask for the four step framework to be displayed. The, thank you. The four step framework breaks down the steps into four categories, which I will go over. Step one focuses on worksite modifications. Consistent with OSHA and CDC guidance, departments must meet PPE requirements for staff. This includes installing physical modifications like sneeze guards, modified seating, and social distancing markers consistent with maximum occupancy requirements. Departments are also required to provide self-screening stations with no touch thermometers available at entry points. Step two requires departments to identify employees who are either working remotely or are furloughed, who will be returned to work as a result of completing step one. Step three involves sending notifications to the employee with a copy to the bargaining units of any furloughed employees that would be returned to the work site. Step four involves reacclimating employees to the changed workspace by walking employees through all site modifications and having them watch the return to work video. May I please have the next document displayed? Thank you. This status update briefly goes over where each department is in the process. Departments may be in various stages of the process based on the type of service they provide and which location is returning staff to the work site. This document was provided to the council on June 17th, so I'd like to 
provide an update at this time on a few items. For steps one and two, the department updates are as follows. Human Resources has completed site modifications for the work site in City Hall. The Library Department has returned a portion of their full-time staff to implement curbside service. No plans yet for returning the remaining staff for in-person service. Parks Department has partially returned some of their staff for limited services. There's also discussion with Parks to return some part-time staff to open and close facilities for weed abatement services and cleaning. There are no plans yet for the return of remaining full-time or part-time staff for Parks. For the Finance Department, site modifications have been completed and we expect the return of remaining staff in the month of July. For Community Development, depending on state and local orders, staff will be returned. They do have a portion of staff that still remain out of the office. And for City Clerk, passport services will return in July. Police Department has returned all of their remaining furloughs staff. With regard to Step 3, where we indicate the number of furloughed team members, 101 employees have, re have been returned to working status. So that's up from the 73 that's currently provided on the update. 48 remain out, out of work or not reporting to work. And there are additional 250 part-time non-benefited staff who are not currently working in, uh, in city services. To ensure as much social distancing as possible, where appropriate, staff continue to telecommute for, con for continuity of services. I hope that you'll see that the city has made every effort to provide a safe workplace for city staff to come back to. The rising cases and the implications for county and thus the city present challenges going forward. Mark Annis will be presenting to council later in this meeting on the county statistics. However, I can report that the city has been impacted by the virus. In April, the city had its first confirmation of a COVID-19 individual among city employees in the Public Works Department. In May, the city had one individual test positive for the virus in the Parks Department. In June, the city has had 16 individuals confirm they tested positive for the virus two in the Parks Department, two in Public Works, six in the Utilities, and six in the Police Department. So despite the city's best efforts, the city has not returned to normal operations and continues to comply with all state and local mandates related to the pandemic. Public health, and more importantly, our employees' health and safety is our main priority. This completes my update on the minimum staffing order. However, the recommendation to the Council at this time is to continue the minimum staffing order and return to Council in 30 days for review of the minimum staffing in compliance with all local and state federal mandates. Thank you. I forgot to mention at the beginning of this item for public comment, this is item two. And to call in to comment on this item, dial 951-826-8600. Now you'll be placed in a queue. An operator will notify you when you're connected to the live meeting. And again, it's three minutes per, per comment. Um, any clarifying questions before we go to public comment for the Human Resources Director? Council Member Placencia? I, I can wait till after the public comment. Okay, Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Stephanie. Can you um, say one more time the number of staff who are currently back to work? I, I know you had those numbers and I missed them. If you could just repeat it. Thank you. you may be on mute. Stephanie, I think you're on mute. Technology. <laughs> We have returned 101 employees to city service of those that were placed on furlough. 48 remain reporting from home. We're told to remain home. All right. Any commenters in person for item two? Feel free to come forward to the podium. Any online for item two?
No phone calls, Adam, too. All right. Back to the council. Councilmember Placencia. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for the update. Um, my question is for those that are telecommuting, are we giving them an option to stay home or to come back to work? Where appropriate, department heads are making the decision to have staff telecommute. And it does depend on whether or not they're providing services to the public at this time or not. So if they are, they would just have to work with their department head because I just want to remind you and I'm sure you know you're the expert but um, we still have COVID here we still have child care issues we still have people that, that have pre-existing health conditions and so I just hope that all department heads take that into consideration for those employees who are telecommuting and can stay telecommuting while doing their job effectively if we've been doing it for months that we take those things into consideration because I think with the new numbers that are coming out many of our employees are, are worried um, we have more employees getting infected and so I do appreciate you and other staff taking um, safety as a number one priority but I just want to um, ask other department heads to keep that in mind uh, there's still a lot of fear and we don't know people's circumstances within their households um, so that those that can stay working from home that we really take that into consideration that was it thank you Stephanie thank you any other council members are going to speak on item two um, Stephanie, I, I know there's you know workers on the on the front lines who are got kind of multiple jobs now. They seem you know maybe working extra hours. How are we how are we compensating or how are we supporting uh, the, the employees that are having a little bit heavier workload now than than before, so to speak? If that makes sense. Um. If I could get some clarification, which extra work are you referring to? Well, it just seems Maybe. like there's more, you know, more responsibilities now uh, with COVID as well as their duties previously. Um, just concerned about again the operation, the the level of 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 work and the workload that they are, uh, you know, that they have with others being off, and and so they're picking up the load from. From, from other employees that are, you know, that are that are not on site or or that are furloughed, what are we doing to make sure that our um, employees that are working now are are compensated? I know we have an administrative, for example, we have administrative leave. We're providing administrative leave for for workers who have been, you know, full on through the pandemic. Um, but but what else are we doing to make sure that we're not overworking our employees? Is the bottom line. That's a good question, Mayor. So we have provisions in the salary plan to allow for additional duty pay. So if we have employees that are picking up some duties as a result of other employees not being in the office, the department can request for that employee to receive additional duty pay for the increased work. Okay. And then interns, interns, I know that's kind of half, half of the um, workforce in my office sometimes. What, what is, is there a, provision for interns to come back or is there a time frame is it are, they, are we treating them any differently than other employees we're, we're treating them the same as the part-time non-benefited employees so at this time we have not returned any part-time non-benefited employees but as services increase if there's essential critical functions that they're performing of course we can reconsider hiring bringing some of those folks back Okay, so so how do how do we because that our our tempo has not really changed that's really increased the mayor's office. So how do we petition to bring our interns back, so to speak, or any department? How do they how do they bring people back? How do they do they have to do they have to request uh, from HR to bring bring them bring more employees back? Uh, I would defer to the city manager's office because those are technically not critical infrastructure workers. So the return of non-critical infrastructure workers would have to be 
uh, decision of the city manager and the council. So I will defer to the city manager for additional comments. Okay, so essential, it's, it's an essential worker list. Is that what we're still working off in terms of coming back to work? Uh, Mayor it's Bailey. Go ahead, Stephanie. No, I was just going to uh, clarify that it's the, the critical infrastructure list that was provided by the governor's office. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Bailey, the, the, to your first question, the employees that are not working, those services are not getting done. So the, right. um, the services that are being conducted uh, by staff right now are being carefully overseen by the department heads and HR to make sure that um, there's a right balance of workload. On the intern side, um, we are, at least under the purview of the city manager, the until our full-time employees are back we're not adding interns back to our departments okay good that's council member melendres do you have a question and then edwards yeah yes i did mayor thank you so much uh, stephanie uh, al thank you so much for the work that you do i know it is extremely difficult times you know some of the and, and I think you've hit it right on the head. How, how are we balancing city services and, you know, making sure that we're able to address those concerns that our community has? Uh, what we've seen, obviously, we saw what I saw was just uh, an unfortunate situation with uh, graffiti up on Mount Rubido. But we've also seen increasing graffiti throughout the city. Uh, we also have seen homeless issue has been brought up by one of the constituents regarding their concerns and and I don't know what our staffing is there but again we have other things that we need to address in addition to the homeless and the graffiti and our streets and our roads uh, how are we doing balance wise uh, you kind of touched on that are we short in some areas where we need to improve uh, you know how's our police department and our fire department doing a balance and uh, making sure that we have sufficient patrol out there obviously we have a lot of fireworks going off a lot of complaints do we have the people we need to try to address that uh, maybe you could give us a little bit more feedback uh, we really appreciate the work we know it is a challenging time but uh, maybe you could give us a little more feedback on how we're doing in terms of that now. mayor bailey if i may um uh, council mayor melendres thank you for those very excellent points uh, homeless outreach is fully staffed. Our graffiti uh, team is fully staffed, and removal is is um, uh, in response to 311 and other uh, inputs. Um, in many instances, caseloads have decreased, but certainly uh, there is a demand out there, as you've so noted, for uh, increased graffiti abatement. What we need to encourage everyone to do. Uh, <clears throat> to help with the cause is, is to call 311 and use the 311 app so that we can get um, uh, our staff out there to abate um, graffiti and to address uh, un the unsheltered population and assist with their sheltering and other needs. So um, at any case, if there's any uh, specific concerns, uh, as always, bring it to my attention, the city manager's office, and we'll address them. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you. Thank you. Just again to clarify, if we were to approve staff's recommendation to continue the minimum staffing order for another 30 days, if at any time in that period the department were to determine that those employees were to be necessary to the work, they can be brought back. That is absolutely the case, Councilmember. I have been very impressed with the plans that staff have put in place. I know uh, as in the Mayor Pro Tem role, I filled out our back to work plan for the City Council and so I can attest to how thorough it was. And I know that as I continue to receive issues raised by constituents, I diligently pass those along to City staff. So if we're starting to see that we need the capacity we don't have, I feel confident that the departments will bring back who is needed. And with that, I, I would motion that we approve staff's recommendation to continue the minimum staffing order for an additional 30 days. 
Is there a second to that motion? Second by Council Member Fierro. Motion by Council Member Edwards. Council Member Placencia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have been presented 30 days is a long time, and I know things are changing and kind of not for the better in terms of our numbers, our COVID um, infections. However, I want to remind my colleagues that we have employees who are out and are not being paid and that impacts our local economy. So again, I want to reiterate that it is important that we bring them back as soon as possible. So I do not feel comfortable supporting my colleague's motion for 30 days. I think that because things are changing and maybe we have an opportunity to bring them back sooner, I would like to make an amended motion of two weeks to um, just extend the minimum staffing order for two weeks and then have Stephanie come back with more information. Um, at our last meeting, I asked what to see what our, um, our county was doing in terms of their employees, and I know they're currently dealing with some, some issues. However, um, I, I think that to extend our employees to be out another 30 days is a hardship for them, and that's concerning to me. So my motion would be for us to extend it for only two weeks. Um, and then if Stephanie can speak to any conversations have, that have been had with our county as to how they're bringing back their employees and when, if we're in conjunction, conjunction with them on um, our plan to bring back our employees. We have not been in contact with the county on their return to work plans. Our collaboration with the county, um, we're looking forward to collaborating with, collaborating with them on contact tracing. So that is the way in which we want to support the county functions. Any other council members looking to speak? We've got a substitute motion on the table for two weeks instead of 30 days. I think that was the, the difference. Mayor, I'll second the motion. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Perry. Any further discussion or comment? Councilmember Hemingway? Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused because I think I heard Councilmember Edwards ask if we needed to bring back folks earlier, we could. Is that, is that correct? And so if, if so, um, is the report in two weeks rather than 30 days just to update us? Because we still have the same authority and power either way, correct? Uh, that is correct. We can bring back s staff as we need to. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Perry? Just one comment on, on the motion because we're talking about bringing it back in two weeks. I think we need to be looking at our summer schedule and looking at the appropriate date to bring this back. I know we meet next week and I'm not sure when we meet after that. There may be a sp 21st or is there a special meeting in between there? I think that's just strategic planning. Okay. The next time the council meets is the 7th and then the 21st. Okay. All right, so we've got a substitute motion for 14 days. So we'd have to call a special meeting for that or um, on that item if that's the will of the council or uh, to go with the original motion of another 30-day continuance of the return to work, or the, excuse me, the minimum staffing order. Councilmember Edwards and then Melendrez. Thank you. Since I'm comfortable with 30 days, I'm certainly also comfortable with two weeks, though I would want to be very clear about any additional information that we would like to see in those two weeks. And uh, I, so I'm comfortable with the substitute motion, though I do think it makes it a bit logistically complicated just understanding when the agendas need to be published and the information that we would need to have. So just to clarify maybe what additional information we would need when that comes back in two weeks time instead of a month. Yeah, Councilman Placenci, is, is your intent to just have this on every council agenda so that we can have an update? And if that's the case, then they could bring it back on July. We could just keep it like a, a normal, um, like, like the communications where we have it on every agenda, if that's your intent. Yes. 
so so my question last time was to coordinate when, when the counties bring back their employees because it, to me in my conversations with the count, county board supervisor they seem to be moving more quick quickly to bring back some of their employees and so i wanted to um, have our staff collaborate with them and figure out their timeline uh, um, because again my priority is bringing back our employees when safe but as quickly as possible and if other institutions were bringing back their employees why were we still at minimum staffing so that was one i do think that if we added to the agenda every council meeting that would be helpful so that we can um, be more intentional um, with the conversations about our minimum staffing orders and where we're at with our employees so that would suffice for me if we put it on the agenda every time we move. thank you city manager is that yep. uh, mayor awesome. bailey i'd be we'd be more than happy to put it on every agenda we can amend the um we can even amend the order to clarify that if uh, that would be beneficial and um, staff has confirmed that they'll reach out to the county for a specific update on uh, their 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 staffing uh, return uh, generally speaking um, i think that our tempo is um, probably exceeds the county's tempo at this point but um, we will get specific information so that we can provide the council with the information that they've requested once again how many employees are we talking about in terms of returning to work i believe uh the hr director said there's 48 furloughed employees currently and it will yeah 48 and then the part-time employees yeah uh, correct correct okay so 48 full-time employees is is the remainder that are returning to work is that right stephanie that is correct, Mayor, okay. and then 250 part-time non-benefits. Okay. Out of 2,400? That's correct. Or Okay. All right, so, so it sounds like everybody's on the same page. We want to go back to the original, or do we want to just scrap all the motions and start over? Would you... Sure. Would Councilwoman Placencia like to just amend her motion to better reflect the conversation sense? Sure. So okay. my new amended motion would be that we um, have staff add to the agenda, every agenda uh, for every council meeting, an update on our minimum staffing levels and um, in conjunction with where the county is. Thank you. Second. Second by Councilmember Perry, motion by Councilmember Placencia. Any questions from the clerk or the city manager on the direction? Is that clear? That's clear. Uh, I'm one, clear. Uh, one point, uh, does the council want this item at its strategic planning meeting on the 14th? I think we have it on the 7th and then on the 21st. I think that'll suffice. Is that Councilwoman Placencia, is that okay? something that comes up I don't see why we couldn't just add it to the strategic planning meeting and if there's nothing to update then no harm no foul but if something comes up then we have an opportunity to discuss it okay that's fine mayor who's that okay it's Stephanie. Stephanie okay may I get clarification on the minimum staffing part is the extension for two weeks or is it the extension to the minimum staffing order the 30 days How I saw it was just till our next meeting, so it'd be meeting by meeting, so not necessarily 30 days. So our next okay. meeting is on the 7th. Thank you. Thank you. So we make a decision on continuing minimum staffing at every meeting? I believe that's what's being requested. Yeah. And is that? Yeah. That's, that's what I would like. I think that it would just be a matter of the updates um, on Stephanie's behalf and since things do change quite frequently I hope that Stephanie this is okay it would have to be in a discussion calendar though versus just communications because there'd be a decision being made right so we're clear on that so logistically is that possible with with the I know city, city attorney might want to weigh in on on the order 
Is there any legal so, issues? Um, you me to, to amend the, okay, the agenda for the 7th we can still do. So what other is the question? So this, the, the order is going to be reviewed at every, at every council meeting. Right. Right. And, it, and like you said, Mayor, it would be on discussion item. So that way, if there's, so a vote can be taken. Yes. Yes. Okay. You're right. That's correct. All right. We got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Councilmember Melendrez, anything more to add? Or is it Hemingway and then Melendrez and Edwards? I, I, I thank you, Mayor. I do have a couple questions in regards to uh, the return of individuals to work. Obviously, the focus has been to to uh, bring back people safely, and as long as the jobs are in compliant with straight requests. I think we need to also include, and, and Stephanie in an early report did talk about the increased number of COVID cases within our city. I, I think we need to have that number uh, when we discuss this every at every council meeting, uh, whether the number is increasing or, you know, whether it's increasing or decreasing. I think uh, employees should, should know that, and I think that needs to be a, a prominent number so that a prominent meaning that we need to speak that about that uh, intentionally, so that um, we know uh, what the uh, what we're experiencing within our city city employees. Yeah, as a part of the report, Council Member Hemingway and then Edwards. No, I, w I was just going to ask for clarification. I think it's already been cleared up. My assumption was that staff would be bringing. Um, uh, employees back as quickly as possible anyway um, so to just simply add it for updates seemed a little laborious and un unnecessary but I mean it, at this point if it's if it's the pleasure of one I mean uh, we can add it to what typically is already full agendas it just seems like an extra step for um, just an update council member uh, Edwards not to belabor the point, I do wonder for process, we could continue for 30 days, have it be on the consent calendar for the agendas on the 7th and the 21st, then it can be pulled if needed for a discussion. Yeah, I think the same, yeah. <laughs> Is that your motion? We <laughs> Let's get to a vote. I would ask Councilwoman Placencia if that would fit with her motion. So we're approving it for 30 days. For 30 days, knowing that it would be on the consent calendar for the next meetings so it could come up for discussion if needed. No, I want that with my motion. Thank you, though. Okay, so it's on discussion calendar at, at every council meeting. Any further comments? Anybody I'm trying to? Okay. Um, so the we're voting on the motion. Councilmember Placencia's motion, seconded by Councilmember Perry, for week or or every at every not weekly, but at every council meeting that we have, we would have an update on and potential. Uh, we're reviewing the orders, potential decision on minimum staffing, Ward One. Can you turn your mic on? Yes. You got word two? Yes. Word three? Yes. Word four? Yes. Word five? Yes. Word six? Yes. Word seven? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Bringing us to item three, Council Member Fierro, Councilwoman Placencio first. Anybody callers? This is item three. Call in is 826-8600. You're going to be placed in a queue uh, for item three. Councilmember Fierro and Placencia recommend update on existing protections for grocery, pharmacy, retail workers and continue existing protections as well as extend requirements to all retail establishments. Councilmember Fierro, okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll make this quick. On April 24th, the City Council passed grocery store and pharmacy um, safety procedure protections. We wanted those establishments to take in the city of Riverside. 
um, given their essential nature, given that even if our economy is reopening, there are certain segments of the population who have to leave their house and they're probably going to a pharmacy or a retail establishment. Um, this is a matter of course we put in that we would review this every 60 days. Um, I think our situation in the middle of this had improved, but clearly now that we're at 99% capacity in our ICU in this county and COVID seems to be growing at a rate, it was when we felt this was a necessary item to put forward. So I recommend that we, we receive and file this information. Um, we continue the protections until the lifting of the emergency order by the city or sooner if we feel it's necessary. Um, there is an item here that we could discuss extending protections or similar protections to other retail establishments. I'm not recommending that. I put that in there so that if we were in a situation where we felt that might be necessary, I wanted to give us the opportunity to react to a constantly changing situation. Um, but as, that, as of right now, I think that these protections were created specifically for grocery and pharmacy, and I think it should remain that way. Um, Councilwoman, if you have anything to add, feel free, but I motion that we receive and file, well, I guess not a motion, I just would advise that we receive and file the information and review this again in 60 days to see where we're at. Thank you. Councilwoman Vicencia. Thank you. So I, I agree, uh, you know, I've talked to, um, I only have a few markets in my, in my area, but um, they've done a pretty good job there um, posting a sign, you know, that they're not, uh, customers aren't allowed to come in if they're not wearing their masks. Um, uh, some of the store owners are telling me that they are having less issues with compliance at their store, but I know that um, some non-markets are having those issues. Uh, for example, Target, and I know that um, Council Member Fierro mentioned um, he didn't want to expand on this, I think, with the right numbers. Um, just be cognizant that not every where you go to or fall in the same guidelines. And um, I know that a lot of it, it um, boils down to security. Uh, they don't have maybe the funds to hire security to enforce these things. And um, I believe we'll be talking a little bit later about some of those things. But, um, you know, I will continue to do what I can to support our grocery stores in the areas, our pharmacies, to ensure that we're keeping our frontline workers safe. In the past, um, Council Member Fear and I have given out masks to our local stores. If there's anything else we can do to continue to support our frontline workers and our grocery stores, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So um, with that, I agree with uh, my colleague that we'll revisit this in 60 days. Thank you. Just a clarification, because you mentioned at one point to, to continue it until the end of the emergency order. Okay. Okay. So, all right, motion to, and a, was that a motion by Fiero and a second by Placencia right. to receive and file? Do we need a, um, I guess it's no action taken, it's just come back in, in 60 days. Okay. Does, is there a need to meet action? Just uh, city attorney, do you need any action on this or city clerk? Uh, yes, Mayor, because they to bring it back in 60 days, just for review again. So if we could just have that reconfirmed, because the res resolution said come back in 60 days, so we want to just reaffirm another 60 days. Motion by Councilmember Vera. Yeah, so yes, I'll motion that we revisit this in 60 days. Councilwoman Vicencia, yeah. second. Any further discussion? Oh, is there, sorry, phone comment for item three. Council members and Mayor Bailey, uh, my name is Ricardo Cisnero, the Executive Secretary of Treasurer of the Illinois Empire Labor Council. I applaud you for doing the right thing, putting our retail worker safety first with the original resolution 23569 adopted back in April. Now extending it is a good move as we have all seen customers that don't want to wear masks in the businesses become unruly and aggressive towards employees and other customers. 
because they're throwing fits like privileged children. As we know, these retail workers are paid to do their job, but they're not being paid extra to be security guards or to be shields between unruly customers, other employees, or, or, or other customers that, that are in the stores. So I urge you to extend this resolution to protect our essential workers, customers, and the businesses that fall under this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments in person, seeing none on the phones? Should I? Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor Bailey and members of the council. My name is Aaron Velarde, and I'm a representative of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, also known as UFCW Local 1167. Our union represents over 19,000 essential uh, workers in grocery and pharmacy retail stores in the counties of Riverside, San Bernardino, as well as parts of Imperial and Los Angeles counties. Our members are hardworking women and men who work at Vons, Ralph's, Albertson, Stater Brothers, Food for Less, CVS, and Rite Aid. I am calling in support of agenda item number three uh, to continue existing protections for grocery and pharmacy retail workers under resolution number 23569, which was adopted back in, in April of 2020. I would like to thank the council for their early leadership in taking action to protect all grocery and pharmacy retail workers that have been on the front lines of this pandemic. This resolution was not just a thank you to all essential workers, it has been an avenue to ensuring that their health and safety is and continues to be a priority. These hardworking women and men are bravely serving our communities and have made it possible for all of us to have access to food and other essential items during a global outbreak. We are now expecting a large increase in COVID-19 cases throughout the state and country, and we all have sharp, uh, a shared responsibility to do everything that we can to ensure the health and safety of all workers. I urge you all to vote yes to continue this existing, these existing protections for grocery and pharmacy workers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other callers on the line? No more callers. We've got a motion to uh, continue for another 60, 60 days, was it? 60 days. 60 days. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Motion passes unanimously, bringing us to item 4. This afternoon, again, any public comment? Uh, City Council is now going to hear agenda item four. Call in to comment on this item, 826-8600. You'll be placed in a queue. An operator will notify you when you're connected to the live meeting. Carly Myers can tell us more about agreement with um, a professional services group for a special project audit. Go right ahead, Carly. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I'm Carly Myers, Assistant General Manager for Public Utilities. However, I'm speaking to you about this item for my most recent position in the City Manager's Office because I have direct experience with it. Can we have the presentation, please? Thank you. Next slide. So for this professional services agreement, the background on this was back in March of 2019, the Vice Chair, um, Councilmember Condor requested at the Finance Committee that a complete and independent audit is was conducted for the Southern California Public Power Authority, which we will call SCAPA. It, he wanted a review of the formation of SCAPA, its original charter, a review of all past audits conducted by our internal audit department, a thorough determination for signature authority, approval for contracts and transactions as back as could be reasonably accommodated and report back at a future City Council meeting. 
we had originally issued that RFP with that amount of tasks in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the order, and it was extremely expensive, so we needed to change our scope of services. Next slide, please, with Councilmember Condor. And we issued RFP 1963. Um, that one did not go back as far as the beginning of the um, SCAPA. That was a 30, 40 year audit. So this one was for 10 years and it would be ending December 31st, 2018. On September 20th from that RFP, we had five proposals that were received. Next slide, please. Ide Bailey was selected as the most responsive proposer based on the requirements. You can see here their location and their amount and the ranks that were determined from a cross-departmental group of people that understand audits. So that was with um, people in our finance department, people in our public works department and the city manager's office. Next slide, please. I'd Bailey's approach includes interviews with council members, board members, city council, um, of course, city council members, the city manager, the RPU general manager, and the city CFO. It was going to include a review, summary, and analysis of the expenditures for the SCAPA contracts. It's going to have a comparison of expenditures to industry standards to determine the amount of savings for our ratepayers of experience due to our SCAPA relationship. Next slide, please. There's also going to be a determination for the level of participation in projects for provisions for finance generation and transmission of electric power to determine if SCAPA participation has provided services in an economical, efficient manner be an analysis of previous audits specifically related to our SCAPA participation. And we expect that the initial findings will be presented to the Board of Public Utilities in November of 2020. Next slide, please. On June 8th, the Board of Public Utilities considered this contract. And they've um, requested that this, uh, this item is discussed with our four newest city council members. They've approved the contract with 50% RPU funding funding at 50% from the general fund, and they've asked for the city manager to also execute all documents. The board also requested that I'd Bailey add the public utilities board members interviews to the scope of service, which they have and they have, um, I'd Bailey has advised us that there'll be no additional costs for that. Next slide, please. So our recommendations are that the city council discuss this agreement from RFP number 1963 for a forensic review of our participation with SCAPA for a total dollar amount of 115,500 with a term ending December 31st, authorize a supplemental appropriation for half of that amount, which is 57,750 from the city manager's non-departmental special project audit program account to pay for the 50% balance, and then authorize the city manager to execute the documents. And that ends my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions. Any clarifying questions? We have a phone comment for item four. Any clarifying questions, Cosmic Cotter? Okay. Uh, phone call. Go right ahead, caller. Hi, Melissa. Good afternoon, Melissa McKeith, Ward Two. So I want to make sure that the uh, current council, particularly the new council members, received a copy of the previous audit that was completed in August 2019. And it's important because what we have at issue here are millions of dollars of money that RPU may have handled inappropriately. And this matters because they're going to raise our rates again this month. Well, frankly, the last administration may well have been letting them get away with um, issues they shouldn't. And this is why I have felt strongly and recommended that we need to take a hard look at having an inspector general in a public audit. So at page 37 of the report about Vincent Price, the live-in boyfriend of the former general manager of RPU who did the audit of his live-in partner, the most serious conclusion, which is not addressed in the latest audit, is that Riverside had no written internal procedures for its audits, for its policies and procedures. It also concluded, and this audit isn't looking at, that there were potential unauthorized spending in violation of the penal code and a misappropriation of public funds. 
And those are serious conclusions. You rarely see that in an audit that's done by a city. And I don't believe, so I did look through the current contract, that those two items were actually going to be drilled down on further. And I bring this to your attention because I was surprised it wasn't attached to the city council agenda for today. Now, unfortunately, even if the new company, the Bailey Group, not related to our mayor, finds that there were monies that went to SCAPA inappropriately, we're so many years after the fact that I doubt that there is going to be a way to recoup any of those dollars. So all of this delay could have been avoided if our city had an independent inspector general or public advocate to whom Jason Hunter or any other employee at RPU could have gone and made sure that we had a credible independent audit at the time these appropriations of funds were going on. This issue with SCAPA is not unique to RPU. There was a lot of controversy in Los Angeles over it too. And the allegations that Jason Hunter put forth were credible allegations. Worse yet, David Wright, who ran RPU, put money through SCAPA in order to do an investigation of Jason Hunter. So if you guys wonder why Jason sometimes comes across as angry, he used our taxpayer money to do something that really was not only inappropriate, but probably unlawful. So, you know, I have no objection to a further audit, but I would About like three to... Three minutes, yeah. Any further comment? Item four. Anybody in the city council chamber looking to comment on item four? No more calls. Councilman McConder. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as my colleagues can see, this has been going on for about two years when I first uh, began to research this and request the audit. Uh, and again, for those that don't know, SCAPA was formed. There are um, 11 municipalities in one irrigation district that formed SCAPA. And the reason was to, to provide joint planning, financing, uh, construction and operation of transmission and generation projects. It was on. It's on. It's on. And unfortunately, over the years, SCAPA has gotten away from their original charter. And what we found out was that they were approving contracts that were committing our ratepayers, committing our ratepayers without this council's knowledge. And that was just wrong. And it was kind of funny. The night before I brought this item to the council, a very respected and long-serving member of many boards and commissions who currently was on the RPU board stopped me and he said, hey, one side I'm going to investigate SCAPA. We sent them $13.9 million last year and we don't know where it went. We have no accounting on it. Our ratepayers are paying for things that we don't know. So it's simply time to, to have SCAPA looked at. There have been things that, um, again, I'm not going to infer, but I, I'm not sure that they were legally done. And it's just, a, it's just time to have this looked at. And uh, it's been two years to get here and uh, I'm glad it's finally here and I hope that it will bring forward the, uh, the results that we hope for our right pairs. Thank you, Mayor. Is that a motion? It is. Motion to approve staff's recommendations. Any other council members? Council member Perry, then Hemingway. Thank you, Mayor. By, by chance, do we have any representatives from the Bailey, I, the I Bailey company on the line or capable of communicating with us? I had questions concerning some of the background work they submitted. Sounds like a no. Pardon right. me, Council Member. I was checking to see if um, they had responded. We invited them very late. Yeah. My error. I, I had some questions concerning qualifications and statements they made regarding utilities and connections to uh, the GFOA. And uh, but if they're they're not available, they're not available. Thank you, Council Member Fiero, or excuse me, Hemingway, and then Fiero. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I think this, it sounds like this is needed. There, it's, a, it's a thing that uh, Councilmember Condor has, has mentioned has been in the works for a while. My only concern here um, is in the current financial reality that we're in. Um, I think we, we can't uh, take money from the general fund. I would, I would just say I, I know that the um, recommendation is to do 50-50. I would rather um, we just allow, I think it's cleaner 
um, from an accounting perspective to just let the entity that's having the audit done um, to to um, to cover the cost. So RP would cover the full um, amount of the uh, audit. Other than that, I think we should move forward with it. So that would be my motion. Substitute motion for 100 percent coverage of the cost by RPU. Council Member um, Fierro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think that that recommendation from Council Member Hemingway, who is the Chair of Finance, I think is highly appropriate that from a financial standpoint, it makes sense for if somebody is going to get audited, if they're their own department, that they pay for it. Um, I agree with Council Member Condor that when, it de when we're dealing with these professional contracts that go through SCAPA, um, there's certainly a lot of room for things to not be seen by this council. There's already a layer of kind of insulation from a lot of these decisions because of the RPU board. And at some point we need to make sure that the elected representatives of the people are taking a hard look at these numbers, especially since some of them are in the millions. So I think an audit is a good first place to start. I would even recommend that we direct to a committee, I'm not sure, maybe government affairs or whatever government affairs became, that we take a hard look at what these professional contracts look like and what qualifies as a contract that's going to go through SCAPA, through the RPU board, and never once be put in front of the elected um, representatives of the city. And we need to remember that RPU is part of the city of Riverside, where we, where it's not us versus them. So. Um, I will second the substitute motion that to approve this and to um, ask RPU to pay for the full amount of the audit, which I think is fair. And um, I won't include it in the motion, but for future items, I believe I would like to send this to government affairs to take a hard look at this problem because if the audit finds problems, clearly we can't just fix problems in the past. We have to actually fix the systemic issues that caused them in the first place. So. With that, I second Councilmember Hemingway's substitute motion. Motion and second. Councilmember Conner? Yeah, I mean, I'll add that even as a friendly amendment, and I appreciate you bringing that up. That was the original intent. This is an RPU issue. They should pay for it. But their board said, hell no, we'll pay for half of it. And I think this council needs to send that message back to them, that this is your issue, your problem. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you need a second motion, that's fine. If I make a friendly amendment, fine. But uh, I think RPU should be paying for this. Okay. Um, was the city attorney trying to chime in earlier? Uh, yes, Mayor. This is uh, Susan Wilson. Uh, regarding the city charter, Section 1202 provides that the Board of Public Utilities must approve all expenditures in excess of $50,000. So if the city council were to approve this tonight, it would then have to return back to the utility board for approval as to the remainder of the expenditure. That was the only thing that I wanted to note, and you might want to take that into account on your um, motion. Thank you. Just, just as the motion maker, uh, it was already over fifty thousand. It was fifty-seven five. So that's what. Well, that's what. The, oh, but that's, that's what the board approved. Approved. I got you. I Yeah, got they you. approved that, so they just they haven't approved the extra. Got you. I see. Half, so it would Thank have you. to go back to them. So it's just procedural. That would have to go back to him. Appreciate it. Thank you for the clarification. Where are we, Council Member uh, Melendres? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You know, over, over time, we've made some changes on how we approve um, agreements through uh, through the City Council. Uh, in that audit, when, when we move forward with that audit, would uh, the auditors include when there were changes made by the Council uh, so that we get a somewhat of a handle on on some of the concerns that were that were discussed? So I think if we're able to show certain things happen maybe before 2000 we made changes as the council in 2005 i think running those concurrently i think would be helpful as well if those if those are included in the audit thank you council member Hemingway and then fiero oh, okay um i just have a quick question um for the city attorney's office so from a procedural standpoint, they have to, according to the charter, approve their own expenditures. If this goes back to them and they say no, 
is does it die there at that point we would have to pay that second half or they just won't do the audit because I'm just wondering what our authority here is to direct our own department to do something if they control the money involved it I just want to understand that what happens if that happens if it goes back to their board and they tell us the same thing they've already recommended to us I think the charter gives the public utility board that um, that power versus the city council so the city attorney that, that is correct. You would have one of two options, either to reduce the scope um, to stay within the initial 57000 approved by the utility board or seek an additional source of funding other than utility funds. Okay. Well, balls in our court. Thank you. Any further speakers before we vote on um, there was a motion and a second on the substitute motion. I think we'll go with that with the funding um, being paid for by RPU. Any further further questions, Councilor Condor? Yeah, just one quick question with the city manager. You do have the money in your audit fund, correct? We do have the money in the audit fund. Yes. Does that change the the motion or decision at all? That this is a budgeted item in the audit fund for is it the general? It's the general fund audit fund. That is correct. What, where does that money go if it's not used? It's not restricted, correct? Correct. It's for special project audits. So some, um, there's a work plan that the, uh, the former Government Affairs Committee had identified for audits. And so we would, if I, and Carly can correct me on this, but my understanding is that special project audit program account is to fund that work program it, uh, yeah I guess my question too is that if it's not used does it go back into the general fund as a unrestricted use or is it now that it's been appointed it must be used for that only or it goes where it, so it is specifically approved for audits so it wouldn't it's restricted it's restricted and Edward you can um, uh, elaborate yes uh it's Edward Enriquez, Chief Financial Officer. So uh, if the funds go unexpended at the end of the year, they would um, um, go back to fund balance. So if they are exhausted, the city manager has the option to carry over those funds again into the same account, or they would just expire and uh, we would uh, not uh, use them again. Meaning they, meaning they would go back into reserve or uh, unrestricted? Fund balance, yes. Correct. Correct. Uh, unrestricted. Sorry if I misunderstood. That's all right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I would I would say I, I my motion would be the same. Yeah. Car Carly, was the was the funding for this specific audit budgeted in the last budget? No, sir. This wasn't a specific line item in the budget. We were anticipating that if the Board of Public Utilities did not authorize 100%, we would be using those funds. So was it in the audit plan or not? No, sir. This was a special audit. And, and okay, so it's well. There were special audits. It's a, it says it's a special audit, or the city manager mentioned special audit work plan. So it's not in the work plan. It's Correct. Not, it's not okay. So it'd be an extra extra item. Okay, everybody clear then. All right, we got a motion, a second. Just one more question, Mayor. Councilman Cotter. The problem is, if it goes back to the Board of Public Utilities, that'll take two to three weeks and then back here in two to three weeks and they're going to say we're not going to do it so we're going to come back here again we're going to get that same 57.5 from the special audit fund it's taxpayer money either way um, it's just this is just delaying it more this has been going on for about two years because of the fights and battles back and forth and I agree from day one I said this is, should be paid for by RPU because they're the ones that have caused this but, you know it's general cause um, it's just going to delay it. So, I mean, again, I agree with Council Member um, Hemingway. This needs to be paid by them, but we're going to go back to them. They're going to go, no. And then it comes back to us, and we say, okay, I'll go pick up the 57.5 from the special audit fund, and off we go. And then we've delayed two months. That's my only fear. I, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate that clarification. I, it's a, more of a principal matter, really. Um, and, you know, I, I think we need to, uh, it would be unfortunate that if that message was sent back that way, um, I mean, we're talking about the financial health of our general fund right now. 
Um, and while we're all one organization and entity, these, um, there are various sectors within our city organization and um, some are in, our general fund is in a different place than RPUs and so I would, I'm yeah. trying to do everything we can to protect our general funds and, and make sure that we're in a good strong financial space um, in, in all our areas. I think RPU is better in a place right now, better to take care of that. I hope that they receive it that way and um, we're talking about uh, an amount that shouldn't uh, mean too much, but when we just canceled certain events to the, about the same tune and dollar amount, and we are talking about how we're, um, you know, what, where our employees are at right now, um, it, it would seem that we need to make every dollar count. So I, I, would, I would hope that they would receive it that way and, and continue to move forward with, with the audit as requested. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Uh, Councilmember Furo. Thank you. And I'm not trying to, to extend this or belabor it. I, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I agree that delaying it f to make a point doesn't necessarily is, wouldn't be considered productive. But I have one more question in terms of the charter. Because I'm guessing it's section 1202 um, that the city attorney office was referencing in terms of the expenditures that the RPU board has to approve. Um, in my understanding, it, those are public works contracts, so obviously building infrastructure, things of that nature. This is a, this is a paper audit of professional contracts that maybe don't fall under that. I just, I'm, I just want to make sure that the interpretation of that is correct, that we cannot direct this to happen because we're not directing them, they're public works contracts, they're professional contracts that we want audited so if the city attorney could speak to that, I would appreciate it. City attorney? Uh, uh, certainly. There are two aspects to Section 1202B of the city charter. The first is that the board has the independent authority to award contracts for construction, professional services, and goods. And that was added to the city charter in 2004. However, the other section of 1202B has been in the city charter for quite some time, and it requires that the board approve any expenditure in excess of $50,000, regardless of who the awarding entity um, will be. So that's why you will oftentimes see things that will go to the city, to the city's um, Board of Public Utilities for a recommendation, and then will come to the city council for a, um, for actual uh, ultimate award. But this, the Board of Public Utilities does need to approve all expenditures in excess of $50,000. And there's no override option, like such if the Planning Commission recommends a project get voted down that they can appeal and with a supermajority vote. There's, so if RPU says no, it just can't happen? So the voters did not include an override provision when they approved that section of the charter. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, we've got a motion. Council McConnor, last word? No, you're good. Everybody's, anybody else on the system? Okay, we've got a motion and a second for RPU, staff's recommendations with the caveat of RPU fully, fully, uh, paying the full freight. Uh, Ward one? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? Yes. Ward five? Yes. Ward six? Yes. Ward seven? Yes. Motion passes unanimously, bringing us to item 4A this after, afternoon. Uh, Council members Fiera Edwards Hemingway recommend business posting of statewide mask order and checklist of safety and protective measures and outreach to businesses and residents of the order and public health need to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Who would like to speak first? I'll lead off if Council you don't mind, Mayor. Sure. Um, I'll speak briefly because I definitely want Council Member Edwards and um, Hemingway to give their opinion on this matter as well. Um, so given our current state of covid <clears throat> you know we've we've had a lot on our plate not just as a council but as a community with um the unjustified killing of george floyd the protests um uh unstable open economy that is constantly being looked at and now we are seeing a hospitalization overflow that we feared was going to happen before it's happening now so in light of this and in light of the governor's order, which was made after the publishing deadline for this agenda, which is why we waived sunshine, because it was new information that was presented that the, mayor, that the governor of California wanted everyone in this state to wear a mask. And it's 
the best tool we have at our disposal to slow this spread. We put on a mask and they will spread slower. These are the type of things that can keep our economy open and keep people safe. But there is a stigma. It has become politicized. So my desire is for the city of Riverside to message in a very smart, concise way why people should be wearing masks and highly encouraging it. Not the same graphic we always send, you know, that people get numb to seeing, remember to wear a mask, but an actual targeted campaign to go, we want you to want to wear a mask. We need to change the sentiment on masks because we're going to be living in this reality for some time. So temperature checks, mask wearing, social distancing, these just need to be become part of what we do every day and we can't see it as a belief in anything other than wanting to slow the spread, keep our economy open, and stay safe. So with that, I, we were not comfortable with the idea of mandating anything. So this proposal is strictly for communications. So we want to ask every retail establishment in the city that's customer facing to post a notice explaining the governor's order to wear masks, as well as a complimentary checklist where people can brag about the procedures they're taking. My staff does this, we do this. And I think that if we make it about who does the best job at keeping people safe, I think we can change the sentiment of how we're viewing this and get back to a place where we want to keep people safe, keep the hospitals at a reasonable capacity and, and get through this the best way we can. So I, I would like to see more attention paid to that. I believe that this item that we're putting forward does that. So with that, I will motion that we improve everything that's being recommended in the report. Um, if there's any other thoughts from Councilmember Hemingway, Councilwoman Edwards, or anybody else up here on the dais, um, I'm happy to hear it. I think that this is the bare minimum we need to do at this point. If we have this great tool at our disposal, I think we need to leverage it in every way we can. So I, I am very, very in favor of us making mask wearing the norm in the city of Riverside. Thank you. Council Member Edwards and Hemingway. It's a great presentation. I would just add that for me, this is about harm reduction and the stakes as Council Member Fierro said are very, very high. So I know that as an office, we've started hashtag ward one wears masks. And so we have started as much as we can to really talk about the importance of face coverings at this time in addition to other harm reduction uh, messages. And I am thrilled at the idea that our city can continue to be leading with positive messages that incentivize all of us to do what we can to get through this time. Thank Council you. Member, anyway. Thank you. Um, yeah, if, if there's one thing I think we all do understand, um, is it's pretty, con there's a pretty good consensus across the board that it's confined spaces um, in moderate close proximity for long periods of time that, that contribute to the, the spread. And if there's any type of mitigating things that we can offer uh, to the residents uh, to keep them safe, um, I think we should do that. That being said as well, um, we have now been able to move to 2.5 um, in our reopening plan. I would hate to see anything that would move us backwards. And we've seen across the nation that there are spaces where folks are moving backward. Um, and I've talked to many in the business community and to find something, anything that we can do to um, help us continue moving forward rather than backward, I think is, a, is an excellent step. Uh, this incentivizes businesses to do all the precautionary things that they can um, and allow customers and, uh, to choose and, and, and to uh, recognize the businesses that are being proactive and incentivizes that. So, I think this is a no-brainer. Um, whatever we can do to keep business moving forward, to keep our city moving forward, and all while protecting residents, I think is the key. Um, and so uh, I, I think this is a great step and, and, and I support it. Any public comment or, or yeah, any public comment? None in the audience, any, any public comment, no calls? Um, this question, so it was, I heard recommendation and then I and then I heard and then in the in the recommendations it says require open businesses and so that in my mind 
Um, okay, please clarify. So the requirement is the posting. So the city will come up with an easy to edit PDF that people can put in their windows. If they already have signs in their windows, that's fine. They are in no way required to enforce anything. It's simply a mandate to post, to remind, because it's our job to help the governor communicate his mask order as well. And we know that that money, that al the allocation of the money that we're still waiting for is highly likely to get tied to our willingness to make sure public health orders are being followed. So to me, this is the best way to do that without mandating that business owners become policemen. I'm not asking anybody to kick people out of their store, to yell at customers, to shame them. But by simply putting a notice in the window, most people will comply. Some people maybe are vague on the order. Maybe may, some people think it's a recommendation. You know, we're helping that message get to retail customers who are gonna be in close proximity to other people. So for that reason, the posting is mandated, but there is no requirement to enforce, is what I meant. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, is, is, it, is it not mandated already by the state or the county? I mean, in terms of posting, I, I'm just trying to figure out what's different than the... To my knowledge, there's no posting requirement in any order. By the, by the county or... No, I, I don't believe there's any posting uh, that is required for businesses like you would a, a county health grade for restaurants. I don't believe there's any posting required. I do know that San Bernardino County just identified a, a posting. I think, I'm not sure if it's required or recommended, but it's a, it's a fillable PDF that demonstrates uh, that it's COVID compliant business with a checklist. Yeah. Um, so I don't believe there's anything that's required. I know the chamber has a campaign that they're doing as well on this, right? It, it, terms of businesses posting something is yes yeah but I'm not I'm I'm sorry that I don't know all the details on it but yes I'm just worried about you know how back to confusion between state and county and the chamber and and the city you know we're looking I, I know the intent is to try to get a standard simple whatever that is um, but it sounds like we're going to have a bunch of different posts on in windows. I, I've, I've already seen several different ones handmade and some of them seem like it's a requirement that they have posted up. Um, that's, that's kind of either OSHA or, or environmental health. That's, that's, that they posted in their, their, their windows. So anyway, I, I mean, I, and I will I, say, I, uh, mayor, that in the report, it does say that we will work with all the local chamber of commerce to work on this campaign. So we're certainly not gonna take it all on our own. If there's already efforts to do this, um, our hope is to work with them to to have a unified message on this. So that was okay. also a per point of it was to start to build that collaboration so that we can stop sending mixed messages and have one cohesive voice. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe it needs to come back with, you know, after you do some research and figure out from the various levels of government and from the chamber what they're doing in this regard so that we can endorse the same language and 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 visuals and all that kind of stuff well this sure. just approves that we're gonna require the i'm guessing your main sticking point is that we're requiring people to post um i mean i don't think when you were dealing with covid any type of time gap is good if it's avoidable i think that the governor's office is going to come to us at some point if we have an explosion of cases and say, what have you been doing to help enforce public health orders? And as of right now, we don't have a lot. So to me, this is a first step that maybe it helps us avoid enforcement. I'm, that's my goal. I don't want people running around citing people for not wearing masks. It's the last thing in the world I want for our community. So I feel that if this is a big, a big step forward that helps us avoid that, it has value. I think that there's no more new information I'm gonna find out. We know I, I want people to wear masks in stores, in retail establishments as the governor has ordered. I think it'll save lives, I think it'll slow the spread. So I think just a reminder on everyone's door, a required reminder that it's the law. Most people wanna follow the law. I wanna follow the law. When I, if I'm going 60 miles an hour and I drive by a 40 mile per hour speed limit sign, I slow down. To me, that's what that would do. But your point's well taken. Well, no, no, I mean, I, I, I 
<laughs> I just think it's confusing. I, I, I'm confused by by the recommendations and, and then not knowing, again, and I, I, it's not clear bef between us whether state, county, you know, the, the, the governor is, has ordered us to, to mask up, right? And that's why we're doing this. And I, I mean, there's no, there's no lack of information on, in my mind, on, on masks and, and what we should be doing in terms of physical distancing, social distancing, six feet, wearing a mask and washing your hands. And we've got, the, we've got all of that all around the city hall, at least, in terms of that message and those visuals. I, I just, again, I don't know what this is asking ultimately for businesses to do. And, and if it's a requirement, mean if it's a requirement, then we do have to enforce versus, you know, and if it's a, there's a statewide mask order, it's in here. So, so there's already a statewide mask order and then there is a campaign from the chamber. So I, I just, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I'll ask other people want to speak and on this, but I, I'm, I'm confused. And <laughs> so I'm sure the public's going to be confused. Well, so you're I, still if we I mean, want I mean, to. I would like to clarify then. I don't want there to be, I mean, you keep saying you're confused. So that's going to make people imply that it's confusing. Simply, we will send you a PDF to post in your window that says that it's the law that you have to wear a mask. It's a physical reminder of a law that not everyone fully understands. We're not required to enforce that they put it up. You know, enforcement's the second step of, if you mandate something and no one does it, then you enforce it. it it's it's a, just one more communication tool. It costs nothing. It's a printed out piece of paper. Um, I don't see any harm in it. I don't see any significant cost in it. So. No, I mean, that, that's, okay, so that's fine. So, so what is it that we're asking them to put up? Because we will think literally so. create a PDF that says you are legally required by governor order to wear a mask in this establishment. And, okay. then there, and then. So I think that's already existing out that there. That is not a requirement. It is not required to put a sign in your window that says you have to wear a mask. I promise you. If it is, I will eat my words. But currently there is no requirement. Whatever ad campaign anybody else has to encourage people to wear masks, we want to add to that voice. But in terms of the posting requirement, it's simply a physical reminder to remind people I watch people walk up to retail establishments every day, see a sign, run back to the car, grab a mask, run in. If there is no sign, it's just another checkpoint to remind people of how important wearing these silly things is. I know it's easy to forget that this problem is here, but when it costs us nothing, when it's cheap, when it doesn't require enforcement, I... Okay. So... Okay. Let's get, let's get some other voices. Maybe they'll clear it up for, for at least me. Council Member... Who's who's up? Council member Jim? Did you do you have a thank you. I, I know I was in line there somewhere. I just don't know if I was next or not. Um, one, I, I'm one hundred percent supportive of wearing a mask. Uh, actually been running in a mask since this whole thing started several months ago, so it hasn't prevented me from doing anything on out of my daily life. I, I completely understand the reasoning, the rationale and the intent behind this. Um, but at the same time, I'll be quite honest with you, I think it's a little redundant. I think it's a little repetitive. Um, several things here. Uh, we, we probably have the best marketing team probably in this region. We've done plenty of marketing. We have a website. Um, doing further uh, PSAs, we've we also done PSAs on this in, in both English and Spanish. I think I've done 17 newsletters on COVID during the last past couple of months, both in English and Spanish. Uh, so advancing that the message, I think, is always a good thing. And like I said, we, we have the best marketing team. They're, they're excellent. They can always come up with, with great ideas. Um, but, but I think a lot of these businesses, they're doing this already. Um, I, I can't speak for the entire city. I can't speak for half the city. I can speak for, for my ward and, and the west side of town. Um, much of what I think we're talking about, one, it's, it has been mandated by, by the governor. Um, there's other portions of what we're talking about today that was covered by the County Riverside Readiness and Reopening Framework Report uh, that was submitted by the county and approved by, by the governor's office. Um, it's interesting, I, I, I spent a couple hours yesterday and, and went out and was walking shopping centers and businesses to see who, who exactly was doing what, though I had a, a pretty good idea. 
And, and what I saw, I saw many, many innovative ideas. Uh, many are using the plexiglass. Many are using the six-foot markers, not only inside their business, but outside on the sidewalk because they're, they're actually monitoring how many people are coming into their business. And if they have to have them outside, they have not only clear markers, but in some cases, there's pylons giving them instructions on uh, maintaining your space and covering your face and staying in place from time to time. Um, and it was just it was kind of interesting because these, these business owners get it. I, they realize that this is this is a very telling time for all of them. This is their livelihood. This is their investment and this is their way of life. And they, they completely understand that. On top of the governor's man, mandate that's on that we're all working under, um, there's also some OSHA requirements. And OSHA requires a written worksite specific plan. They require employee training and they require individual control measures and screenings. So everything we're kind of talking about, in, in my mind, has been repetitive at this point. Um, like I said, when I, when I went out yesterday, and I actually took pictures. So if you saw me in front of your business yesterday, <laughs> uh, taking pictures of your business, Ms. Garcia and I, we weren't the mass police. Uh, we, all we were doing was checking up on seeing who was posting what in front of their businesses. And I probably have close to 100 pictures here. And of that, I would say of, the, of those businesses, 95 to 97 percent of them were doing exactly what we're discussing today. Um, and, and I think that's a, they're, they're commended for doing, doing, doing that because like I said, this, this is their livelihood. This is being able to maintain their way of life, their quality of life, and being able to produce a service to our, our community. So and you know, it's also interesting is not only some of the, the cleanliness steps they were taking, but the disinfectant and washing carts before people go in. Some businesses are actually providing, if you go into a business and you forget your mask, there's multiple businesses out there that are, if you walk into one, they're ready to hand you one. They're monitoring the amount of people that they have inside their business because we found a few lines while we were out there at all. And we didn't see, we didn't see any disagreements or anything that were out there. Um, and I also spoke with the chamber, and the chamber does have a program going, and they, they have their own website on businesses that are, that are in compliance and the safety measures they're taking. So, you know, I, I just, I'm just not sure of, you know, I, I'm not stuck on the confusion part of it. I'm stuck on the repetitive, repetitiveness and the redundancy to it. Um, so I, at this point, I'm, I'm not going to support this at this particular time. If it gets to be an issue, I'd be, be glad to bring it back, reevaluate it, and, and certainly if, if people are not going to be in compliance, then we need to do something else. But in, in my mind, in the time that I've spent in the community, and like I said, I have a ton of pictures here, um, I, I'm not going to support it at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Council Member um, Placencia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I disagree respectfully with my colleague um, council member Perry I do think that it's though I applaud those businesses that are doing it not all of them are and it goes back to what we did for the grocery stores there were some who were proactive and doing these things already and there were some that weren't and that's why we felt the need to put certain policies in place so I think um, to speak to Council Member Fierro and, and Hemingway and uh, Councilman Edwards' um, recommendations, I think it goes to show that we're taking that step of uh, reminding those to um, put this sign up to remind their, the consumer, the customer, that they need to respect the rules and um, the businesses. Sometimes the, the business owners don't, you know, obviously they're not um, set up with security they're not there to fight with with the customer however those that do have signs um, still have those customers who who choose not to um, abide by the rules so I think that this is a step in the right direction to remind those that it is very important that our numbers are increasing I do believe that um, this is the right thing to do to support our businesses and the community to remind them that um, we are taking a stand as a council to show the importance of wearing your mask in public in all um, businesses um, 
I think the more that we support these kinds of efforts, the, and as uh, Councilmember Fierro mentioned, destigmatize wearing a mask and and not make it um, about anything other than supporting and keeping our community safe and healthy. Um, I think that this is a good thing. So. Um, this is not confusing for me. This is very clear. We are supporting our businesses and our business owners, and more importantly, the customers, to remind them that it's important to wear a mask. So I completely support this effort. And um, if the chamber is doing some campaign, great. You know, we can partner with them. I don't think we need to wait or send it to a committee for further discussion. I think that um, this is. This is us taking the lead on ensuring that we continue to do right by the community. So, thank you. Council Member Hemenway. Thank you. I, I think we just want to be clear, this is not a punitive action toward businesses. Um, this is to help businesses. Um, the fact that only 95% were complying means that there's 5% that aren't complying. And uh, this is not, to my knowledge, a state mandate to put a sign. It is a state mandate to have a mask. Uh, th th this is one proactive step, again, this is to help business so we don't roll back and, and fall back from our phases to reopen. Uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't, th we've seen many videos all across the, you know, all around now where folks are in spaces not wearing masks and um, this is one way for businesses that are also um, doing all extra precautions as well as masks to highlight that. Uh, we don't, you know, it is our responsibility to care for the residents of Riverside, not some other entities, even if they have the best interests of business in mind. It is our, our responsibility. And so if some other organization is also doing something uh, to support businesses and give them a check sheet to put up, then that should tell us that it's important. It's important enough to be done by them. We should recognize that it's important um, and not have to rely on some other space to do it. Um, and so. I think it's great to have the checklist. This is probably why it was even f uh, come up with. Uh, I mean, I, I had spoken to the chamber a while ago, and I'm grateful for all their work. But to say, can we put a checklist of incentivized things in there? Maybe, maybe that's where part of this is, is all coming from. But I think as far as what we need to do to care for all folks is look at the fact that, you know, the straw poll is 5% aren't complying. And so to, to do something as simple as just put a sign up that reminds people um, that, hey, a mask is required here, gives the business uh, that extra cover and enforcement to be able to say, hey, friends, you see the sign, in case people genuinely forget, or in case that they, you know, um, choose to not be there because they require a mask or otherwise. I just think that this is not a, it, it, I think this seems to be, if the, mask, if the mask sign is already up, as many have had, then this is, this is no extra effort needed. Uh, it's already been accomplished for those that have already done it. We're not asking anything more. It's for the ones that aren't, for the extra added effort to protect citizens. Um, we know that cases are rising. That should be important to us. And we know that any little mitigating effort, something as simple as a mask, will help us protect folks, will help other, our businesses move forward and continue to open, and will we'll, we'll be an extra added effort all around to, to slow the spread. So. I don't understand why this is such a contentious space right now. It seems very simple and easy, and uh, we're even providing a printable PDF to help them, uh, anyone that needs that, that extra effort, uh, extra help. So uh, I, I'm not sure where the challenge is. This seems like, a, again, like a no-brainer to me. Council Member Edwards. Just to echo many of the things that were said, I believe that time really is of the essence here and any confusion that exists to me speaks to why we as a city need to undertake a campaign like this. I am hearing from individuals who say we want to hear from our city. And I think as some of my colleagues have said, it's important to note that this is about more than masks. It's a checklist that will as Councilmember Perry pointed out, showcase the many good ideas and the many protections that people are putting in place to keep everyone safe. This is a very positive action, and I completely agree that as a city in a public health crisis, this is our responsibility. And, and I'm not confused about the, about the message at all. I'm confused about the recommendations. That's that's what I'm confused about. I just I don't understand. Um, 
what we're asking businesses and how we're going to enforce that. Because if it is a requirement, then in my mind, as is written, then there's going to be enforcement. And, and then, I mean, I, really, we need to hear from staff in terms of what direction they need from this, because I don't think it's been vetted through staff. I, I'll, I'll let staff speak to that. But Al, what is it you need? Are you, are you clear in terms of direction from this report on what your staff needs to do? That's, that's, I should have said that at the beginning versus anything else because I think we're all on board with the need to continue educating the public. That's what we do. But ultimately, we need to have staff able to execute what is, what we're asking them to do. So I, I believe that <clears throat> we can definitely We've had uh, marketing staff review this since it's been published. So I believe what we can do is work together as a, as a city team and put together draft materials in coordination with the other entities. I just literally got a, a toolkit sent to me, forwarded to me by staff that the county has put out. Um, I understand there's a, a there's a link that I just received uh, uh, that the uh, on the county's modifiable sign. So I think to the Councilmember Fierro's um, comments, we can work with our community partners and other agencies to align the the sign and the signage and the checklist in quick order, and uh, make sure that we're part of a system of communication so that we're not duplicating or triplicating um, right. messages. And, and but uh, it, I find the recommendations, uh, we, we can interpret them, and I didn't hear any uh, concern on the part of marketing when they reviewed this. So happy to um, uh, the will of the council will implement this and do the great job that um, marketing always does um, to help get the word out and ensure uh, greater public health across the city so we can get back to a, a normal, healthy, functioning society. Yeah, again, and my conf the confusement is what I'm concerned about is businesses being, you know, having this, the, the, the state, the county, and the city all sending them something different. That's, that's what I'm concerned about. So, And one, one other point. I mean, I think it's also clear that um, our marketing team needs to come back to the council and put together the entire suite of communications that we are doing so that you can all be aware of yeah. the multitude of communications so that we can be value adding based on the recommendations of this staff report and because um, uh, we we owe it to you as a, as, a, as a council and to the community to provide you with a comprehensive look at all the communications we've been doing so that um, you're as informed as you can be so you can give us the policy direction that you want us um, to have, and but w we can implement this direction perfectly. I'll include that in my motion that, um, in terms of the communication plan, um, putting that together in quick order and coming to us, hopefully at the next meeting if possible, um, with with something. But yeah, we would obviously want to review that and make sure that you guys have an opportunity to put together a real plan. I definitely don't want you to slap batch together in a few days, so I apologize if that wasn't clear enough. No, good. No, it's good work. I like that. Thanks. That's any any other council members looking to speak? I've lost Jim. Are you back up? Did I skip anybody? Just just very briefly. I just I understand everybody's opinion, and I understand that I understand the intent behind it. Um, I don't want to give the impression. No, I like I said, I'm 100% uh, behind having to wear a mask. It's a necessity, and we're going to have to do it for an awful long time. Um, I, I also am very concerned about uh, the safety of, of those in the public. Um, my contention behind this is I just think it's repetitive. And sometimes we get uh, business owners who call and, and without enforcement, and I'm not advocating enforcement at this time, but when somebody does call and ask for help, what they get is they get one of these between the city, the county, and the state on, on who's responsible for doing what. Uh, so I, I hope this moves forward. Like I said, our marketing team is, is outstanding, and they'll, they'll come up with something great. Um, I understand the intention behind it. Like I said, I, I just think it's a little repetitive. That's all. Thank you. Councilmember Condor? Yeah, maybe it's just the two old guys, Jim, you and I, that 
have the same feeling here, but uh, you know, the conversations I've been having with the businesses are, um, you know, we get it, we, we know what we're doing, don't treat us like children. So just in the last 24 hours or 36 hours probably, I started thinking I went into a pharmacy, a bank, a grocery store, a tire store, a dry cleaners, a cobbler, I went into Kohl's, I went into a Chinese takeout restaurant, and a donut store, and every one of the stores had a sign up on it and said, we require masks to be worn when in this facility. They're all doing it. Uh, I just think it's, it's it. It's more just redundant, and the business people are like, we know what we're doing. We don't need the government to tell us. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. So that's my issues with it. Any other council members looking to speak? If you'd chime in one more time just to make sure if there's... Council Member Fiora? I just, I didn't want to belabor it because Council Member Hemingway stated, it, but, you know, it seems to be a point that this is in no way an accusation against businesses at all. It is, I am asking for their help in communicating this state order. And that is simply it. I do not believe the businesses aren't doing well. I run a business that's doing all these checks. I have friends who own businesses who are doing all these checks. And I think that there is a lot of information, but I have never felt that redundancy was a bad thing. And I'm certainly not gonna see it as a bad thing as it relates to information that is pertinent to people's health. So in that case, if I am being redundant, I'd rather be redundant than not, than have that message not land with somebody when it could have slowed this spread, kept our economy open, and kept people healthy. So, may I just add to you, for all those businesses? Can you chime that, in, please? Oh, sorry. Can you? Just, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, so we can go through. I can make sure right. we. Member Hemingway. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Mayor. Uh, yeah, for 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 those that already have it up, um, then yeah, there's no added. Um, challenge there and so um, this is again just just another proactive step to empower businesses to say we have um, a tool for you and uh, in, in encourage those to continue moving forward and doing that thing good summary statement at the end before we take a vote was, was there a, was there a councilman Fierro did you did you move that so yeah yes. council member Edwards I'll second and third council member Hemingway? <laughs> All right. Ward one? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward, ward four? I don't say no. Ward five? Yes. Ward six? No. Ward seven? Yes. Motion passes five to two. That brings us to closed session this afternoon. City Council is adjourning to closed session pursuant to items 5 and 6 on the agenda.